please, I'd like to welcome our next two speakers who will present on nutrition and metabolism, pertinent topics very often discussed in the FA community. Cynthia Taggart is a registered dietitian in the Bone Marrow Transplant Unit at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and Dr. Lindsay Romick Rosendale is the director of the Metabolomics Core Facility, also at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. They will speak consecutively with a joint question and after session afterwards. First up is Cynthia Taggart speaking to us on nutrition issues in children with FA. Welcome, Cynthia. Yeah, so my name is Cindy Taggart and I am a registered dietitian at Cincinnati Children's. I've been there 13 years now and I work with the Cancer and Blood Disease Institute, which houses our um, Fanconi anemia patients as well. I've seen Fanconi anemia patients who are pre-transplant, may never come to transplant, active transplant, and post-transplant. Today, we're gonna to cover a variety of hot topics that oftentimes I hear from my patients um, and families with Fanconi anemia. We're gonna review growth charts and what to expect, healthy eating, how to make every bite count, mealtime routines. Um, we're gonna also talk about vitamin and mineral supplementation and tube feedings. So first we're gonna talk about some growth charts. These are actual patients who have Fanconi anemia. Their parents have graciously agreed to allow me to use their child's growth chart. So we're just gonna look at a couple and see um, how I would look at them from a nutrition perspective, how other dietitians who are not familiar with patients with Fanconi anemia may look at a patient's growth chart and what, what does it mean and what's okay and what's more concerning. So this first, our first friend here, this is his weight. It's a little boy who is eight. Um, and you can see that his weight, he's always been below the 50th percentile, which is perfectly fine, perfectly normal. What we are looking here at here is, is he following a particular growth curve? We're looking to see, has he lost a lot of weight, gained a lot of weight? What kind of are his weight trends over the last couple of years? He is doing a very good job of falling out between the 10th and 25th percentile, which is perfect. There's nothing, nothing wrong, nothing concerning with that. Not every child, healthy, unhealthy, will grow exactly at the 50th percentile. It's a general guideline range. We like patients to grow between the 3rd and the 97th percentile, but we recognize too that there are conditions and diseases where children will never grow between the third and 97th percentile. And we will talk about that as we go along. We also look at a child's length. Are they able to gain some type of linear height? We're also looking to see, did have their height plateaued and they're no longer able to gain length and what is going on? Were their medication changes? Have things changed in their diet? Um, but overall here, in this particular case, he's growing between the 10th and 25th percentile. Again, this is perfect and completely normal. I am short, if you've ever met me, I am 5'1". I have a child that is always tracked between the 75th and 90th percentile. And I also have a child whose height matches this particular patient very well. Is that smaller child ever going to be as tall as my older child? Probably not. It's just where he has chosen, where his genetics have allowed him to fall out in the growth chart. And then we always look to see kind of how proportionate a patient is by looking at their BMI. What is their weight and height comparison? Again, we're looking for that trend. And so here, again, he's tracking again between the 10th and 25th percentile which is really a nice track. That's where he's going to be. That's where we want to continue to see him grow throughout his um, late school age and teenage years. This little friend, completely different patient. He is almost four. He is below the third percentile. This is a patient who if a dietitian or a clinician did not realize that the child had Fanconi anemia or before diagnoses. If he came to clinic, people would be concerned, man, he's just not growing the way a normal child would. 
And the first thought when a child isn't growing is maybe they need more nutrition. So oftentimes a patient like this is gonna end up seeing a dietitian where we're going to try to push a lot of calories into this kid to see if we can get him to grow. With that diagnosis of Fanconi anemia and you coming to my clinic and I look at this, I think this looks really good. He's gaining weight. He's not gaining weight like a lot of his peers, but he is gaining weight for himself and he's starting to establish his own growth curve. And that is important. With patients with Fanconi anemia, I'm looking for them establishing their own growth curve, regardless of where that growth curve appears on the growth chart, whether it's above the 50th percentile, right at the 50th percentile, like our last friend who was between the 10th and 25th percentile, or here where we're significantly below the third percentile. This is a very appropriate growth chart for this patient. This is the same little friend, this is his length. And again, without that diagnosis of Fanconi anemia, a dietitian or clinician looking at this would say, man, this kid really needs some more nutrition. If I got him more nutrition and got him to gain weight, I could get him to gain the length that he needs to make him grow to the, at least the third percentile. But again, looking at him from a Fanconi anemia perspective, I'm thinking this is a really good growth chart. He's starting to establish his own curve for his length and he is able to gain length every year. Again, I'm still looking for those same parameters of has he flatlined the last couple of years, just not making any progress growing. That's a little bit different than just being um, below the growth curve. His BMI is a little hard to interpret. He's had some issues with length. It's some, we all know toddlers are a little finicky about getting measured, getting weighed, coming off a week of an illness. We just ate a really good meal. I'm not so concerned about the fluctuations in his BMI here because I can see good weight gain and length gain patterns in his weight in his linked growth charts. And my last little friend, he is well, well below the growth chart for his weight. But again, over the last six years, we can see he has a nice trend of slowly making progress and gaining weight. And you can see that that curve mimics a typical child's growth. It's just much further below the normal growth curve. That's okay. And this is what we want to see is mimicking that growth curve um, of healthy children. His length is amazing. Even though it's not on the growth chart, we can still see that every year he is still gaining weight and it's a great representation of him following his own growth curve. And so that's why I picked this one is because I just really like how well he has grown even though it is very different than a normal healthy child, it is very good for him. His BMI, again, isn't very, I'm not able to use it very much. The little triangles indicate that he is below what the growth chart in, in our computer system will allow me to show. So I'm not really worried about that because I can see his weight gain patterns and I can see his length gain patterns. And that's what I am most concerned about. In doing a presentation on nutrition, I felt like I had to just briefly touch healthy eating, kind of go over that, and then we will talk about some other things. So our gold standard currently for healthy eating is myplate.gov. Um, myplate.gov replaced the Food Guide Pyramid several years ago and is put out by the USDA. The purpose of this was to simplify that half of your plate needed to contain fruits and vegetables, a quarter of the plate protein, and a quarter of the plate whole grains, and then dairy supplementing the meals. So what does this exactly mean? So you want to eat a wide variety of fruit. We want to eat seasonally. That's when fruits have the best flavor. We can do a lot more variety eating in season. We want to replace some of our sweets. We all crave sweets. I especially crave sweets. Um, dried fruits, dried cranberries, 
apricots, cherries, mangoes, raisins are all great sources of sugar when we want something sweet, but a natural sugar. To help us meet our fruit goals, we can keep our fresh fruit rinsed and ready to go and where we can see it. So we're more likely to grab an apple over the cookies. Vegetables. Vegetables are very important, lots of good variety. Again, eating seasonally, varying our veggies, adding vegetables into breakfast, adding spinach or peppers to a morning omelet or eggs, um, having a side of sweet potatoes with your morning eggs, um, incorporating color into our salads. Salads don't just need to be a plate of greens, making sure that we're adding some carrots, um, again, peppers, cabbage, um, cauliflower, tomatoes, anything that's going to give some color to that salad to make it more appealing. And then raw vegetables are a great um, addition to any dips or dressings, which are great sources of calories, which we will talk about later on. Grains. Popcorn is a whole grain, which is a great snack. Um, we want to use whole grain pastas when we're making pasta dishes. And then whole grain cereals is a great breakfast option as well as a snack option. Now we're not talking about fruity pebbles, but more of like a Cheerio healthy grain cereal. Protein. Protein is an important part of everyone's diet. I recommend sometimes we're all busy. I'm a busy mom. I have a lot going on besides my full-time job. So sometimes you have to make dinner thinking ahead for the week. So making meat once that can be used for two meals during the week, you know, cooking up some ground turkey and tonight it's tacos and tomorrow night it's gonna be used in a casserole. I'm um, just thinking ahead. Um, snacks, um, good sources of snacks with protein in them are nuts and seeds. They're easy to keep on hand. I know we use them a lot when we go to the baseball field just because it's something quick and easy that we can take with us. Now, granted, there are a lot of nut allergies out there. And in that case, we need to be a little bit more careful about that nut option. Seafood is a wonderful lean source of protein. I know we have guests from the East Coast and the West Coast that you have a lot of plentiful seafood options. Um, keep that on hand. There's a lot, for me who live in the Midwest, I don't have those same fresh seafood options available, but there's a lot of great frozen seafoods that are available in the market that can be kept on hand in their quick, easy dinner, quick dinner meals. Dairy. Dairy is an important part of our diet and it's something that we don't want to forget about. Um, this slide contradicts a couple of my other slides only because dairy is a great source of calories. So depending on where you are and what your goals are, the USDA puts out that we should be drinking fat-free or low fat yogurts and milks. Um, but sometimes when our patients need some extra calories, we do recommend the whole milk, um, whole fat yogurt products. So for the purpose of this slide, it's about adding dairy products to your diet, whether it's in a smoothie, um, adding yogurt, or just having a glass of milk with a meal. MyPlate.gov also really focuses on tips for managing salt, also known as sodium. Um, remembering that salt is found in a lot of our processed foods. So we want to choose as many fresh vegetables, meat, poultry, um, seafoods when possible, and using spice and herbs to add flavoring instead of flavoring with salt. Fat, we want to keep our meats lean and flavorful by grilling, broiling, roasting, or baking. And then using some low fat yogurts when making tuna salad or chicken salad instead of the high fat on um, mayonnaises and miracle whips. Sugars, we've already talked about that sweet tooth and incorporating in fruits, um, whether it's fresh fruit or dried fruit um, to help with that sweet tooth, sharing our fruit or sharing our sweets with um, family and friends, and then really being mindful about what we are drinking. There's a lot of sugar in soda, fruit juices, energy drinks, sports drinks. A lot of sugar is consumed in our beverages, so making wise choices with our beverages. 
one topic I get a lot from a lot of my patients is should we follow an organic diet or not? Choosing to follow an organic diet is a family's preference. I will not make a recommendation that you should follow um, an organic diet, but if that is something your family wants to do, by all means, I will support that in my, in my practice. Um, so from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the professional organization that I belong to as a dietitian, um, the oncology subgroup has said, there have not been any direct studies on humans to show that organic foods can prevent cancer or other diseases and more effectively than conventionally grown foods. So far, there is no consistent evidence that organic food is more nutritious than conventionally grown foods. Again, it's a preference. I'm not going to side one way or another, but if it's something that your family wants to do, great. If it's something your family doesn't want to do, that is great as well. If you're kind of thinking about an organic diet, but I'm not really sure, um, there is an organization called the Environmental Working Group, and every year they publish a list of foods that is High, has the highest trace amount of pesticides in commercial farming. This list is called the Dirty Dozen. So these are the foods that they have tested and found the most amount of pesticide in. And as you can see, it's strawberries, spinach, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, potatoes. Things that have a thin skin that you are more likely to consume. You're not peeling grapes or peeling cherries on a regular basis. These are things that you will eat the skin of. And so they've found that those have a little bit more pesticide in them. You can, uh, it's always recommended that fresh fruits and fresh vegetables are rinsed very well under cold running water. There is no need for any of the fresh um, they're called vegetable washes or fruit washes that you can buy at the supermarket. You don't need to buy those. There's no evidence to show that those work any better than just good cold um, running tap water. So this world or this environmental working group produces this dirty dozen list and then they also produce a clean 15 list. This list you can see has these products have a thicker skin or how they are grown, it's more protected from any type of chemicals that a farmer may be using, or it's a skin that you're not going to eat. So an avocado, you're not going to eat the skin of an avocado. Sweet corn is grown inside the husk. Pineapples have that thick outer shell that we don't eat. Onions, you're gonna peel away the skin. We got papayas, sweet potatoes, eggplants, asparagus, um, cauliflower which grows kind of in an enclosed leaf type thing even though you don't see that when you buy it at the supermarket it comes in this and that's how it grows is an enclosed leaf and they tear that away um, before they bring it to the market cantaloupe broccoli mushrooms cabbage honeydew melons and kiwi so we've kind of talked a little bit about healthy eating but one of the topics that always comes up with my patient is, oh my goodness, my kid is such a struggle to get them just to eat. So I've entitled this next section we're going to talk about, about every bite counts. Not all foods are created equal. Um, there are some foods that are much higher in calories than other foods. So when we're struggling to get our children to eat and to get the calories in they need, we need to focus on a combination of foods, but definitely making sure that we incorporate some of these higher calorie foods into their diet. So the first list is foods that are just naturally higher in calories. Bananas have more calories than an apple. Um, sweet potatoes, avocados, nuts, any type of nuts, are nut butters, which include almond butter, cashew butter, peanut butter, hummus, um, any variety of cheese, peas, and then dried fruit. We also have this category that I like to call food additives. These are things that I can add to food 
and add to meals to make them have a higher calorie concentration. So butters and oils, uh, fats are important in a patient's diet, in everyone's diet. So I know some people will panic when we say you need to add a little extra butter or a little extra oil. It's small amounts of oil and butter are, contain a lot of calories. So it doesn't take a lot and it doesn't alter the flavor of food in a negative way. Um, peanut butter powder is a great way to get some extra protein as well as calories. You can mix it in um, to smoothies. Whole milk, I know earlier we talked about fat-free, low-fat milk, but when we're trying to get in calories, the 80, 90 calories per eight ounces versus 150 calories per eight ounces can add up and make a big difference during the day. Heavy whipping cream can be used in um, casseroles and sauces. Um, adding sour cream, mayonnaise, cream cheese are great sides for dipping on sandwiches um, and tacos, spreads on bread. Maple syrup to sweeten things. You can put a little bit on fruit with toast. We can add flax or chia seeds to cereals on toast with peanut butter. Um, in some of our baking needs, it's just an extra source of calories. Salad dressings and dips to go with our fresh veggies, jams and jellies, and then dried milk powder can also be added to some of those casserole dishes. I often recommend food products and food additives like this as they don't alter the taste of food as much as there are some medic medical grade um, calorie additives that I have that I can give to patients that patients can get. But I feel like those really alter the taste and the texture of food. So I'd much rather do it with things that you can purchase in the grocery store than with a medical product. Am I saying that those medical products are bad? Absolutely not. They all have their place. But if we can do it with food, it's a better option. Making every bite count, milkshakes and smoothies are an easy way to get extra calories into your child's diet. Um, so I wanted to give you a basic milkshake recipe of just whole milk and ice cream. With that, you can add things like the peanut butter powder, um, chocolate syrup, strawberry syrup. You can add fresh fruit. Um, you can sneak in a little bit of avocado. You can add in a little bit of candy pieces whatever you want to make that milkshake more appealing to your child. Smoothie is also a great way to get in calories um, with a milk juice base, any type of frozen or fresh fruit um, or vegetable that you wanna put in there, a little bit of yogurt for some protein. Again, sneaking in a little extra dry milk powder is a great way to add calories. And it's much easier sometimes to drink the calories than eat the calories. Mealtime routines. Um, so oftentimes I'll get patients that will come and see me in clinic and they'll be like, oh my goodness, we're feeding our kid all day long. She's eating constantly. He's eating constantly, but he's just not gaining weight. Or I'll hear, it takes them three hours just to eat dinner. What can we do? So this is entitled Parents Provide, Kids Decide. So parents provide what to eat. We want to encourage you to serve a variety of healthy foods, offer new foods with favorite foods. So if tonight we're having salmon, which is a new food, then we want to pick a vegetable and a grain that our child is familiar with. We don't want to go with a brand new, all new foods on a plate where we got salmon and we've never had asparagus and we got some fancy rice. We don't want to do that. If salmon is our new food that day, we want to do a salad that our patient is, our child is familiar with, and then maybe some mashed potatoes or a pasta dish that, that they're familiar with and that they like. When introducing new foods, it can take 12 to 20 times to introduce a new food before a child is accepting of that food. So it takes a lot of patience and it's, it's a frustrating process for everyone. 
I know, I get it, it's frustrating, and it takes a lot of time. So just because the first time you present it, it doesn't mean that it's a no-go forever. I also very strongly encourage my parents to not become short order cooks. We want you to prepare the same foods for everyone in your family. When we start becoming the short order cook, that's when our child will only eat pizza and chicken nuggets and only certain types of pizza or certain types of chicken nuggets. It needs to be, this is what's for dinner. There are things here that you like. You're going to sit with us and you're going to eat with us. Meal times. Meal times should be limited to 20 to 30 minutes with snacks um, timing being 15 to 20 minutes for a snack. We don't want a child eating and having food presented to them all day long. We want there to be time for a meal and then play time, distraction time, coloring, reading, play, physical activity, and then food provided again. We want to have some as much as we can because we're all busy to stick to some type of meal and snack routine so that a child knows that every two to every four hours there will be some type of food available to them. This one is a little could go either way. If we're struggling to get our kids to eat solid foods at meals but in between meals they're constantly drinking juice or filling up on milk they're not having the time to let the stomach empty and they're getting a lot of calories between meal times. So we wanna offer water in between our meals so that we can consume our calories with meals and snacks. Um, parents provide where to eat. They're gonna decide where we're gonna have our meals and snacks. Are they going to be at the kitchen table all together with the family? Or are they going to be in front of the TV watching our favorite show. We recommend limiting distractions during mealtimes, i.e. sometimes the television, the tablets, phones, etc. We want mealtime to be a pleasant um, environment, happy conversation, not, not focusing on how much we're eating or how much we're not eating, but instead just a conversation where we can be together and eating together as much as possible. This is so, so important, especially um, for our younger kids, our toddlers who are learning how to eat. There's so much modeling that goes on at the, at the table of watching a parent eat food. If you want your child to eat Brussels sprouts, you have to eat the Brussels sprouts too. And some of it is, do I use a fork? Do I use my fingers? the mechanisms of chewing, all of that is important for parents to model to their children. As your children get older, that mealtime is just a time to spend together. Children get to decide how much they eat. If we are offering them healthy foods at every meal and every snack, then we know that we provided them with the right choices and they need to choose which foods that they're going to eat that day. Maybe one day they love apples and the next day they want nothing to do with apples. That's okay. That's a natural process of learning and depending on their taste for the day. We do expect your child's appetite to vary from day to day. Our appetites vary from day to day as well. Some days we eat a lot and other days we don't eat nearly as much and that's okay and that is normal. Collectively over the week we are looking to see it should average out to be enough for that child to grow. Um, if your child for a week continues to show a decline in eating, that's a concern. Or if we have several weeks where we're just not eating like we used to, then that becomes a concern. But one day of bad eating is not is not a bad thing. It's the multiple consecutive days or the consecutive days that turn into weeks where we become concerned. Um, we're gonna to touch briefly on vitamins and mineral supplementation just as kind of a brief overview. No vitamin, no mineral can replace a healthy diet, a variety of fruits, vegetables, proteins, grains, and dairy. A complete multivitamin can definitely be incorporated into a patient's routine. 
I will caution not all gummy vitamins are complete. Um, they have definitely improved over the time. We all like our gummies, um, but be careful. And if it's just kind of a supplement, it's okay. If we really need to make sure that we're getting all of our vitamins and minerals, then we need to pay attention and read those labels on the vitamin packages a little bit more. If we have a patient, um, bone health is important. So calcium and vitamin D, we do um, sometimes encourage some calcium and vitamin D supplementation, especially if a patient is not drinking milk or if they're not going out in the sun a lot and we'll encourage a vitamin D supplement. Iron, iron can go one of two ways. Is, and this is why I included it. If your child is receiving a lot of blood transfusions, we do not recommend an iron supplementation at all. If your child is drinking a lot of milk and not eating a lot of other food, um, they are at risk for developing iron deficiency anemia, which is different. And oftentimes it requires an iron supplementation and removing milk from the child's diet. Um, sometimes in our teenage patient population, if a girl is menstruating and not eating any red meat, she can also develop iron deficiency anemia, at which point she would, may need an iron supplementation. And then last topic is, I know a little controversial, a little, um, everybody has their own opinions. There's no right or wrong opinion. Um, we've all had our own experiences, but I wanna talk a little bit about feeding tubes. And feeding tubes from my perspective of why they're, why they're good, how they can be helpful. And then I'll take some questions about feeding tubes. Again, I know everybody has different experiences and very much different opinions about this. Um, so there's two types of feeding tubes we're gonna talk about today. The first one is an NG tube. It's inserted into the nose, um, through, goes down the esophagus and all the way into the stomach. These types of tube feedings are typically meant to be a little bit shorter term, a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. Um, if your child's had an illness and they just need some help recovering some weight gain, it, it's a good thing. If overall long-term we're struggling with not meeting our nutritional needs, whatever that may look like, um, sometimes we will recommend G-tubes. Um, so there's a picture of a G-tube. It is a surgical procedure um, where your child would go to the OR. Um, and it goes in through the abdominal wall into the stomach. Um, and then we can feed that way. So collectively talking about NG versus G-tube, um, aside, feeding tubes. Feeding tubes can help meet a child's nutritional needs. It doesn't necessarily mean that they need help meeting their calorie needs. Maybe they need help meeting their fluid needs or their protein needs or some extra vitamin mineral supplementation. There's different ways and different reasons why we recommend feeding tubes. Um, it helps take some of that pressure away from meal time. If meals become a constant battle um, at home where you've got to eat, you've got to eat, you've got to eat, you're stressing out because my kid hasn't eaten. It takes away some of that pressure and lets food and meal times to become a more enjoyable experience while we work to stretch the stomach um, and just work on textures and tastes and flavors of things. And they can also be used for medication administration. So I've had several patients who have gone through um, bone marrow transplant where they get feeding tubes simply because it's easier to take medications that way. And they prefer it and it makes life for everyone much better. Um, the cons to feeding tubes, obviously there's a little bit of discomfort. Um, and placing the tubes. The NG tubes are placed bedside by our bedside nurses. Um, the G tube, like I said, is an OR procedure that heals over time. It may be considered an artificial way of feeding your child, but there are definitely ways where we can put food through a G tube and G tube. There's a ton of products, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, 
yes, it's not the normal way of putting food into the mouth where we chew and we swallow. Sometimes we recommend feeding tubes because patients have difficulty chewing and swallowing food. And then of course you have to take care of the tube. So before I really talk about this slide, there's many different types of feeds. There's many different types of formula companies. I work for no formula company. I am in no way supporting any of these particular formulas. I just put them on here as examples um, that we can talk about um, and to share with you that just because there's one product, there's a lots of different products and there's lots of different options. So if your child has a feeding tube, there are options and you are not stuck with only one formula. So there's many different companies, many different products. The products um, range um, higher calorie, lower calorie, um, what they're made of, what the protein composition is, is it what kind of vitamin mineral composition it has, is it more of what we are now calling a food-based formula versus a standard product, how broken down is the proteins? Are they free of different allergens? We look at them from a tolerance perspective when we put a patient on a tube feeding. We look at the ingredients. We look at the cost to the family. Is the insurance company going to cover it? Are you going to be buying this out of pocket? What can we get from um, your DME company? There's a lot of varying factors that go in. And just because you start out on product A doesn't mean that you don't ever try product B or product C. There's, there's a lot of different options. So I don't want you to feel like I got put on this product, but I don't really like it, but I don't know what to do. There are options available and you need to just discuss with your medical provider and your dietitian, and probably your insurance company and um, your medical supply company as well. Um, so finally, we all come in many different shapes, sizes. We all grow very differently. We have very different body types. Um, these are my, my dogs. Um, so obviously I have some different um, body types. They all have different nutritional needs and it's okay. They're all sweet, fun, loving animals. We're all sweet, fun, loving people that just have different needs in diets and body types, and it's all okay. I will be taking questions after Lindsay's presentation. I saw that there were a couple questions pop up in the Q&A um, while I was chatting. And then my contact information, I am available via email. I have a Slack nutrition Q&A that will be available for several weeks in my telephone number. Granted, I working from home mostly right now. So I would not recommend leaving me a voicemail currently. That's not my most reliable source of communication, but by far leave me, an, send me an email or we can chat on Slack as well. Okay, thank you, Cynthia, very much. A lot of really great information. Um, I, and you did my job. You reminded everybody that if you have questions, we're going to wait till the end of um, Dr. Romnick Rosendale's uh, presentation, and she'll be up next. So, Dr. Lindsay Romick Rosendale, we welcome you from Cincinnati Children's Hospital to present on manipulating metabolism to improve overall health and nutrition, a clinical research study in the FA population. So, thanks for being here. Okay, so today I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, metabolism and um, Cindy has really gone into the, is, is much more well-versed and has gone into in-depth about um, sort of what, um, what food should be um, eaten, which, which is fantastic. Um, I just want to introduce metabolism, um, why it's important and how I think we can impact um, what's happening uh, in terms of metabolism. And, uh, and I'll go ahead and um, then briefly introduce the clinical research study that I'm conducting at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, um, which uh, is currently enrolling um, participants. Um, okay, so I think, first of all, I'm gonna start out by um, talking about what we already know about our bodies. Um, and how it relates to metabolism. So I weigh about 145 pounds and most of that, let's say 64% or so is water. 
though you can't tell that just by looking at me or you. Um, and I mean, as far as organisms go, I, I look fairly solid as most of us do. Um, and so after water, the next largest proportion of myself and others would be protein at about 16%. And not just in the, the muscles, which, you know, help us to uh, sort of save the world and uh, do things like, uh, as, as many of you have seen as Superman from my good friend Jack Temperley at most of the adult meetings, um, but also in things like hemoglobin and, and our blood. And another 15% uh, of me is fat and about 4% is minerals uh, like uh, calcium, in the bones and, and also iron in the blood. And about 1% of that are uh, carbs or carbohydrates. And most of which is either being consumed as I'm talking to you or it's sitting around as glycogen waiting to be used. And we'll get into that um, more as we go. But here's the problem. It isn't as though I've just eaten 145 pounds of food and then that's what happens, right? There's complex, processes processes that are going on. Um, the body's constantly deciding what to keep and what dispose of as waste. And so this sort of instant and eternal loop of things that are happening um, in our body and we're using, losing, and gaining different things. So People say a lot of the time, you know, you are what you eat, but really, I think, what does that mean? So all of the proteins, fats, carbohydrates, nucleic acids that make up me, of course, comes from food, right? And every organism has to keep taking in and breaking down the food to keep resupplying itself with uh, the raw materials that it needs for survival. And all of that activity requires energy, which we also get from food. So how our bodies convert what we eat into energy and raw materials, that answer is sort of what, as I mentioned, this never ending series of reactions that are dedicated to these two vital and pretty contradictory things that are happening. And those two major pathways that are at play are going to be your catabolism and your anabolism. And so, this is essentially the process where you're breaking down substances and releasing energy and we go from larger molecules to smaller molecules and then with anabolism is where you're building new structures so this process is going from the smaller simple molecules to those more complex ones that are that require a lot of energy and so in terms of you know how our bodies are constantly sort of reinventing themselves in this state of loss but then also rebuilding and even though all of this is happening at the cellular level the consequences are are really much larger right these two sets of reactions are coming together to make up our metabolism essentially and so what is metabolism, right? Well, people talk about metabolism in terms of how fast uh, our bodies burn fuel and into food and how high your personal energy level is. And that's fine. And you read a lot about that in things like personal fitness magazines. And when people are trying to sell you different um, sort of uh, products that will change your metabolism. But Physiologically, metabolism really describes sort of every single biochemical reaction that goes on in our body. Now, these molecules that our body is constantly breaking down and then rebuilding, we've, we've likely heard of, of a lot of these. And we're not going to go, I'm not going to go into in great detail about a lot of them, but we hear a lot about carbohydrates, lipids, fats, and, and proteins. And so, I'm, there's a lot that goes on in metabolism, and I don't want to go into excruciating detail about it and list every single compound that sort of is represented within all of these groups. So I just want to focus on what is important, at least for my study, and, and what is sort of the, the main part of that. And that's glucose, right? It's sort of the be-all uh, molecular fuel that your cells need to make the ATP. And so ATP being that molecule that your cells use to drive all of those reactions that I mentioned. And so you need to make new polymers and you need to get, if you need to get anything else done, 
um, whether it's, you know, sort of operating a sodium pump, um, potassium pump, or even detaching the head of a myosin filament uh, to contract a muscle, right? Um, all of these things are requiring um, ATP and, and energy. And so ATP is just too unstable to store, right? That would be the easiest way, but our body can't just store ATP because of its stability. So the cells will store this energy in the form of glucose, right? That, that they can then break down or catabolize and convert to things like ATP um, whenever they need it. And that's the easiest way. And so we're talking about cells of what I would call a typical individual, not necessarily an individual that has Fanconi anemia in this case. And in addition to getting enough uh, sort of energy from ATP, our cells also get energy from things like fats. But many of those most important uh, ones exclusively feed on glucose. And so let's take really, I think your brain is a good example of this, for instance. So I'll, I'll talk about the brain being like a car, right? A car needs gas, it needs oil, it needs brake fluid, and a number of other materials to run properly. Um, well, your brain also needs special materials to run or function optimally, right? Things like vitamins, minerals, other essential chemicals, and glucose, right? So the fuel or energy for your brain, think of that as glucose, uh, you know, very simplified. But if it's not needed right away, again, your energy uh, is going to be stored as things like glycogen in your liver and your muscles. So again, your body is always at work uh, sort of ensuring that you have the nutrients that you need um, to get to that ATP that you'll use uh, for energy. And if your body doesn't believe that it already has what it needs, the problem is, is that it will resort to catabolizing or breaking down sometimes really important molecules like uh, you know skeletal muscle to get the protein that it needs and we'll, we'll I'll touch on that a little bit more later but the problem is if things go awry and your body isn't signaling properly then it will make sure that it can properly you know feed your cells and and that can obviously be damaging to other body parts. So I think that the, the most simple way to talk about you know, how our body uses different nutrients um, is that it's not going to handle every food and nutrient that enters into the body in the same way. It just can't, right? And so after you're done digesting, some nutrients are going to go straight to your body, sort of pile of stuff that's going to be burned up right away, right? It's going to be used very quickly. But others will have to be converted into something else before the body can actually use it or utilize it. And so an example of this would be the carbs and sort of the fats in your buttered toast. That can go directly into being oxidized um, in, in its usable energy. But those amino acids and maybe that bacon, that has to be converted into other molecules that get broken down like carbs. And if you want, that's the only way that it's possible if you're going to get energy out of it. So I mentioned before that the molecules in the body are constantly, I'll say, changing shape, right? They're renewing, they're rearranging themselves to either build things or to use energy and eating foods replenishes these nutrients. That's the bottom line, especially glucose. Then depending on what your body needs, um, when you last ate, certain hormones like insulin are going to help decide what to burn and what to store later. So this of course is important in, in an important function of hormones in general, which is why things can go you know, pretty badly if the processes don't work properly and if your body and the hormones are not sensing things correctly. So exactly how glucose levels can spike or plummet and how we convert nutrients into energy and how all of that relates to eating, hunger, weight, uh, metabolism, all of these things, even health in general, it's, it's complicated, right? We, no one fully understands how this works. And so um, we are, are we, need, we know we need food to survive, right? Ideally, we would consume food like Cindy talked about um, that's going to, um, you know, that's going to help us to, to grow and give us the best possible nutrients for our body to use and break down. And so that's why we're really um, doing this type of study. 
So I know that a lot of people have heard, and especially when you talk about, um, you know, ongoing things like diet fads and you talk about uh, fasting and what is fasting. And I'm sure many of you that are listening have had to um, be fasted for um, a study. I know that that's the case for a lot of, a lot of things. And so when we talk about a typical individual, when it comes to how the energy is converted, um, it really depends kind of on on when the person last ate. Um, and that's really what we're seeing in especially in the Fanconi population. When so we all switch back and forth between these two nutritional states, the absorptive or that fed state, um, which is during or after eating and those post absorptive or fasting states when the GI tract is empty and the body is running off of stored supplies. So let's say that you just finished dinner and you're still in that absorptive stage and your digestive system is breaking down the foods into um, a bunch of mostly glu glucose molecules that are passing into your bloodstream. The first bit of glucose gets delivered throughout the body and is tapped immediately to generate ATP or that energy that our body needs on the spot through a process called cellular respiration. So that's, that's sort of the, the easiest, uh, I'll say, um, way out or what really should, should be the easiest way out um, for the body to use. But that's, that's not what happens to all of the glucose, right? And so you've got a lot of extra glucose that's floating around in there. It's just going to happen. And the cells don't need it in that moment, right? They may need it later. And so again, energy in the form of ATP, it's just too unstable. So it's not going to go ahead and use that glucose and convert it, right? Because it'll essentially lose it. And so all that extra glucose, you know, has to go somewhere. And so a lot of times if it's not converted to ATP, then it's going to be stored as fat or glycogen, right? So those are a couple of the other options. And then whenever it's needed again, then it can be converted back into glucose and that's, and that's not problematic. And so that storage sort of is part of how you can end up gaining weight um, because how much energy gets stored depends partly on your basal metabolic rate, right? That's, um, that, that's sort of already, I don't want to say set in stone, but, but you have a basal metabolic rate that you're working from. So now normally if your body senses that the glucose levels are too high, um, there's a series of events that will trigger them to take them back down, right? That's the best case scenario. And at this point, there's sort of a shift from that catabolic reactions to those anabolic reactions that our body needs. And so, for example, it, it sort of puts a stop to breaking down that glycogen um, in, in your liver and muscles to release glucose for energy. And instead, it's actually going to start um, sort of ramping up and uh, ramps up the process of what's called glyco uh, glycogenesis and where that extra glucose is then linked together to form uh, glycogen. And so these are just processes that are your, your body sort of through sensing uh, should instinctively know when you get some nutrients, things like glucose too high um, in, too high in the body to prevent uh, sort of adverse uh, events from happening. So it's also going to activate other processes where the liver converts the glucose into tri uh, triglycerides and then ships them off to our adipose tissue uh, for storage. So let's say that our body um, puts all that glucose, lipids, and proteins where they need to go. And you can just sort of coast into that uh, fasted or post-absorptive state. That, that would be um, the initial goal, right? But the problem is, is that then several hours later, even though your small intestine is still hard at work, your cells have been helping themselves to that remaining glucose in the blood. And eventually, your blood sugar level will start to drop. And this will then trigger the opposite process to happen, right? Resulting from the release of glucose, fatty acids, and glycerol back into the bloodstream. So 
the key here and, and part of what we're trying to understand from this study is that now, if it's been a few days since you've eaten, right, which shouldn't be the case, but if it's been a few days and a typical individual uh, and you haven't eaten, then you've used up your blood glucose and your glycogen stores and you don't have those sugars that are left to feed things like the brain, which are needed. Um, your body, body is going to launch into a process that's going to start converting things like fats and amino acids into glucose so you can get the energy that your brain needs, right? That's, that is a needed function, right? But the question is, is this normal, right? Is, is this, what if something sort of goes awry and our bodies actually prefer or are forced into functioning in you know what some would call an an advanced state of, of starvation um, is that what typically would happen um, to an individual with Fanconi anemia even if they have actually eaten within let's say they've only undergone an overnight fast and their body is already kicking in to the idea that it's running low on things like glucose because there's maybe improper sensing of the carbohydrates within the system. So that's, that's really something that we're trying to understand is if that is the case in an individual that has Fanconi anemia and that possibly that's why we have things like loss of muscle mass, um, or we may have excessive weight gain or weight loss, um, really when that shouldn't be indicated based on the amount of calories that an individual is consuming. So I'm going to very briefly, and I know this word is, is somewhat scary. I mean, it's it, including to myself who studies it. So I just want to break down, and I know many of I've given some of these talks at camp and whatnot before, um, but the, the idea of metabolomics, um, it was, it's a word that was made up, right, like many, and it was coined, and it, it basically means that, you know, I study all of those small molecules that we talked about in those first few slides, like glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, ATP, et cetera. That's really what the study of metabolomics is, is studying those small molecules in terms um, of metabolism. And so, and the great thing is, is that there's actually so much that's known about metabolism and these complex pathways from years of being studied by so many scientists. And, and so it allows us to create things like metabolic maps um, where we can actually know how the body's metabolism should work. And then the idea that we can start to tweeze apart what's gone wrong and you know, ideally the goal would be that we would be able to fix this in terms of an individual whose metabolism is not functioning properly. So I also just want to very briefly um, discuss sort of how we go from, I'm collecting uh, samples uh, during uh, say a, the clinical research study from the lab, all the way from that to getting you back results on how your metabolism and how your body is processing things like glucose. So. The idea is that very, you know, simply, we will go from the process of collecting the samples, and we do a lot of different specimens. In this case, our clinical study is only the collection of urine and blood. And so I'll talk about that in a moment. We then process the samples. We then put them on our NMR spectrometer, which Jack Temperley is pictured with here as he's hanging out, uh, was hanging out with me at one point in time. And then we're able to get what's called a metabolic um, spectrum, which also a lot of people talk about as a metabolic signature or a metabolic fingerprint. And so each of those peaks represents a single or a series of small metabolites. So that is, in that picture, you're actually seeing the amounts of things like glucose, all different kinds of sugars, you're seeing the amino acids, you're seeing all of those compounds, including ATP, ADP, NADP, all of those compounds that are, that are relating to energy, those are then present within that metabolic signature or fingerprint. And then we're able to use a series of different types of software and analysis tools to link that back to the biology, which is really the most important part. So in addition to, you know, coming in and being a part of the clinical research study, if you're like someone like Jack, 
then I might actually end up putting you to work. That might be part of it. So you might get to come and hang out and see the NMR spectrometer. This is the one that um, we have in my lab. And then um, you know Jack hangs out and, and we go eat Skyline afterwards, which really is the biggest bonus point for him, I, I think. So this is, um, I also just want to briefly mention, and this is a, an incredibly complex slide, but the idea is in this study specifically, I want to bring this up because if you look at each of those red dots, and so what I'm what I'm showing you is that this is glucose. This is the this is the indication for glucose. So in my clinical study, these are individual carbon atoms. We can actually label, which is what we're doing, each of those, and we're tracing the glucose through the body in a non-invasive manner to where we can see how and if the body is actually processing that glucose. And so that's a really nice thing where we're, all of these processes that we talked about, the cellular respiration, how we're getting our energy, our ATP, all of that can actually be traced by the technique and by using that instrument that Jack was pictured next to um, in a way of, of even just simply looking at an individual's urine or plasma, saliva, things like that. So it's a really nice non-invasive means of monitoring how someone's breaking down important nutrients like what Cindy has been talking about people should be consuming. So I think that uh, I, I want to very briefly introduce, and um, I've talked about this at meetings before, but um, we were lucky enough a couple of years ago to actually, um, I've been at Camp Sunshine a few times um, in Casco, and um, while there, we were able to collect um, some urine specimens from individuals um, with FA and then also um, from their non-FA uh, siblings. And we were able to match these by um, both age and gender um, as well. And so that was a, a, a really nice um, aspect um, other than getting to see all of you in person, um, a really nice thing that is able to happen at camp. And so we're actually able to separate, right, what you're seeing in this, um, basically in this figure on the left is that we're able to separate um, persons with uh, Fanconi and those individuals, again, they're their non-Fanconi, the controls are their non-Fanconi um, siblings. Um, we're able to begin to separate them based on that metabolic signature that I mentioned earlier. And so this indicates that their inherent metabolism is just functioning differently. Even individuals who are living, as you would imagine, in the same household and likely consuming the same diet or diet very close to one another. And so this is really what started to get us to think about what was happening in this population. And the other thing that we actually noted, so we can go in and look at individual compounds um, with, within that metabolic signature to see what's really standing out and what's really causing the separation and the differences between their signatures. And so we note things like a really abnormal sort of urine fingerprint and an accumulation of acetone and other what are called ketone bodies. Um, those types of compounds are relating to things like thyroid hormone um, synthesis and um, acetaldehyde biosynthesis in relation to things like um, ethanol degradation. And so that's interesting because I know we've talked about, and uh, I'm sure you've heard in many talks about the, um, the contributions and things happening with alcohol dehydrogenases. So this was an initial finding that led us sort of to dig a little bit deeper into what was happening in the FA population. And so the next step was basically to go one step further and then collect blood and specifically, and for our use, we actually um, collected plasma from individuals with Fanconi anemia and healthy controls. And this happened at Cincinnati Children's um, in an independent cohort. And so the metabolic profiles, again, were significantly different between someone with Fanconi and a, a compared to a healthy unrelated control. And again, these were age, gender, and ethnicity matched to our Fanconi population. And so we see individuals with Fanconi we believe that they're breaking down proteins and, and uh, triacylglycerols as is indicated by this increase in both glycerol, free glycerol, and also lysine in the blood. And again, if you remember back, I talked about how it's our belief that there's this inherent sort of 
trigger where it's possible that a certain portion of individuals with FA, they're actually breaking down things like skeletal muscle and breaking down when they don't necessarily need to because their body is not sensing nutrients properly. And so this was something that was obviously of, of great concern for us and, and another reason why we wanted to go further and in looking into the study. So the other thing that really started to concern us was that when we went in and looked closer at the plasma, we see low levels of plasma carnitine in, in a person with FA. And carnitine is known to both combat, combat DNA damage and ROS production, which obviously in terms of a DNA repair defect, this is problematic if there are very low levels in an individual with FA. And, and again, it's, that could be problematic as well. But we were also concerned because at the levels that we were seeing the carnitine in the FA population, that this is a key nutrient and it's typically seen at these low levels in malnourished persons. And so again, these were individuals that based on their dietary journals were consuming enough calories and were consuming uh, enough foods that should have, they, they should not be malnourished by any means. And so again, this is when another sort of perplexing thing that we saw that was happening specifically in the FA population where we wanted to get a larger cohort to try to see what was really happening. So I just wanna very briefly mention, um, I, I have um, just two slides left, um, very briefly mention uh, sort of the study design. It's actually really pretty straightforward and, um, and simple. So. You'll, you'll basically come in first thing in the morning so that you're, again, this is a study where you would need to be fasted, best, best and most reproducible accurate results under um, fasting conditions for these studies. And we'll collect baseline urine and blood samples. And then we'll also, um, something that's a little bit different is that we've been working with the um, nutrition um, team and we'll be performing a few sort of standard body composition assessments like the checking the grip strength with the dynamometer, measuring skin folds, again, very simple, non-invasive. Um, we'll do a simple, and it's actually a, a really cool um, procedure where you basically just breathe into a machine and then that machine is going to measure your oxygen consumption and your carbon dioxide production. And that will actually help to determine whether a person's body is sort of preferring to use things like carbohydrates or fats for energy. And so um, the study participant, you're then gonna basically, you're just gonna drink a drink that is high, a glucose, concentrated glucose water, basically. It's glucose, uh, the sugar, uh, the glucose you're, you're used to in um, just a really small amount of water. And you'll drink that and then you'll wait a little bit uh, of time to allow things to sort of begin to um, work metabolically and take place. And then again, we'll just collect um, midpoint urine and blood collections. Um, we'll do a repeat of the breathing, um, of the breathing test that's done again to see how the body is actually uh, reacting to consuming that concentrated glucose. Um, and then again, at the end point, we once again collect the final urine and blood. So that's really, you're just um, hanging out uh, with me and with um, a couple of other researchers and the clinicians at um, Children's and um, lounging around and, um, and we just do a few sample collections. So I just wanna wrap up by sort of saying that, um, you know, I think that based on our preliminary results, we do think that we are seeing sort of molecular mechanisms and metabolic pathways that are really impacting the nutritional status of persons with, with Fanconi anemia. And we think that, that getting a better hold on what's really happening by doing these tracing experiments is actually going to help us to eventually develop things like different nutritional approach, approaches and understanding how we need to feed an individual with FA to help for either weight gain or weight loss or possibly, you know, to build and develop novel therapies that would allow us to combat that loss of things like muscle mass, right? I mean, that's, that's a huge issue if, you, if you're not able to build muscle. And so um, I think that the idea is this 
the um, improvement of overall body image, improvement over overall health, right? These things impact things like immunity. And so I think that that is really what we're, what we're hoping to get at is to um, sort of understand why these things are happening and, and why the body is, is reacting and responding so differently to um, nutrient intake um, than it is possibly a, a typical individual that does not have Fanconi anemia. Um, so that's all I have, and thanks for listening. Okay. Wow, that is really fascinating and exciting. Thank you so much. So we'll bring Cynthia back on. We'll have questions and answers. And remember just to type in your questions at the bottom of your screen, and Jordan will get them answered for you. Hey, everyone. Um, hey, Lindsay. Hey, Cindy. Thanks for being here with us. It's nice to see you guys. Um, so we do have a few questions um, in the Q&A box, and some of them are more related to food, some are related to supplements, and then there's a couple related to metabolism as well. So we might just start with some of the, the food questions first. Um, so the first question is from Dana, and it says, I'd love to know if Cindy has a specific recommendation for a child's multivitamin. So we have two recommendations um, that we typically use for um, a children's multivitamin, either a Flintstone Complete or a um, children's Centrum multivitamin. They're both, I think they're chewable. Um, you can crush them if you need to, but those are our two top recommendations for a complete multivitamin. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and also Alejandra has a question about, um, and I maybe you guys can answer this. Um, and Lindsay, you might be able to speak to this as well, but um, it says, I wanna know if Cindy recommends the uh, quercetin for Fanconi anemia adult community. I, um, I know about um, quercetin. I don't have a specific recommendation. I don't know if that's something Lindsay can speak of that she participated in those trials. Uh, yeah, so um, I am and with I am working and I actually um, will we'll be doing some of the um, data analysis, of some of the samples that are collected during the course and trial. So I have been working with Dr. Mehta. Um, I think that, I mean, obviously at this point in time, the trial was ongoing. And so the amount of participants who have actually completed the trial, I'm not sure that ha is enough to make any, any actual final conclusions. I do know that, and again, this is also why um, we're sort of adding to and, and talking about doing these additional um, experiments because we do see things like, you know, and, and some of the other individuals with Fanconi who are parts of that trials, um, you know, there, there is the possibility of things like weight gain. There is the possibility of things like weight loss. Um, unfortunately, and, and again, this is sort of the case because these m metabolic processes are so complex, um, we don't fully understand why some people are, but clearly quercetin is, is positively impacting. Um, you know, we've, we've not seen, to my knowledge, any negative impact of quercetin, but we have had individuals most definitely reporting positive outcomes or what they believe to be, I think is in, in terms of a positive outcome. So, um, I mean, I'm obviously I'm biased because um, I um, am a good colleague of the individuals running um, the trial, but I will say that again, and completely anecdotally, because I don't think there's enough data yet that has been collected, but um, I mean, we are seeing positive outcomes um, in, in patients. So, um, and I think that's something that I, I would definitely recommend reaching out to Dr. Mehta if you have a specific um, thought or concern or something happening with um, your, if that adult with Fanconi um, has something specific happening that they'd like to know if quercetin would be beneficial for them, I, I would definitely recommend that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify a little bit with you on that, um, at this point, is there a recommendation for people to start taking quercetin now, or should they just speak to their physician about it or um, the, the Cincinnati team about that or the people that are running that trial? I mean, I would always recommend to speak with um, a, a physician or care provider to before, even before you begin taking um, a supplement that could be purchased someplace like at a 
you know, any, any time you can go, yes, can you go out and purchase things like some, I saw someone mention things like carnitine. Can you go out and purchase these supplements? Yes, of course, a lot of these things are, um, they're not harmful. They're, they're things that have been out there for, for many years and they're sold at places like GNC, that's true. So you can get your hands on a lot of these supplements. Um, I think my recommendation, especially in um, a disease population where we know little about um, sort of effects of, of even the supplementation, um, I would definitely recommend um, contacting um, again Dr. Meta, and and they can they're welcome to do that um, through me. I can get them in contact with the right people, or obviously Farf um, can do that. But yeah, I, I it seems like taking it's just like taking a vitamin supplement. But I think in terms of this, um, I know knowing the proper dosage, which is you know that the dosage that you're getting in a clinical trial is going to be different than what you're going to get at GNC, unless you likely um, take a lot of those pills because it's a very different type of supplement. So my recommendation would, would always be um, to um, go through your primary care physician before you take a supplement. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Lauren has a question and, and it kind of um, coincides with the vitamin thing. So are there iron-free vitamins that you guys recommend since the Flintstones uh, discontinued their iron-free product? I am going to have to look that one up and get back with you on that one because I don't like off the top of my head. No, but I know that there are lots of iron free supplements. Oftentimes the gummies, I know I said I wasn't a huge fan of gummies. Gummies are iron free because they haven't figured out how to make iron in, fit into the gummy tablets. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and you guys, um, if you get that information, you can um, let me know that too, and I'll communicate that to, to families as well. Um, we have another question about um, supplements. Let's see, is it possible to FA patients somehow supplement carnitine? Yeah, so that, I mean, carnitine is, I guess that's the, the good thing about if, um, we need another cohort. I mean, the, the bottom line is that obviously because the FA population is so small, um, it, it takes some time to get enough samples to where I feel comfortable and, and um, that the data is, is what it is. And so um, the bottom line is, yes, obviously carnitine, thankfully, it has been used for um, supplementation for other conditions. So it is readily available. Um, that's that's not an issue at all. Um, and so it would be a, a quick means if it was found to be. Um, I don't know that I have enough um, enough data to to say that it it should be supplemented at this point in time. Um, but but it is out there and it's already approved as a supplementation. So um, it could be a quick um, addition for a treatment um, if we find that those results are true. Great, thank you. We have a, a couple questions from some international folks who are curious if they're able to join your study, Lindsay. So we would have to discuss, I mean, obviously um, the, the study is open for any individual with Fanconi. The problem is, is that the um, individual would have to get here. So um, would have to get to the States. So um, as of right now, we would love to be able to expand and, and the study ultimately would be doable. Um, someplace off-site, I think, but for um, for the initial ones, and because we're attempting to very specifically map the metabolic pathways, um, I need to closely monitor and do a few more time points than, than what we ultimately would do. So um, the answer is yes, anyone can be a part of the study. Um, the difficulty is that the person currently would need to be able to travel um, to Cincinnati Children's to enroll. Um, Great, thank you so much. Um, just to stick with supplements a little bit, um, one more, what type of probiotics would you recommend size and strength, if at all? Either of you. <laughs> I don't, I mean, that's not my area in terms, of, I don't know if Cindy has comments on it, but. Um, so probiotics kind of a slightly controversial topic. 
I don't know like the context of the question. If you have any type of line, so anybody going through transplant, we do not recommend any um, probiotic supplementation. If a food contains a probiotic like yogurt, by all means, we say you can have that. It's any type of supplement. So if you have any type of central line, pick line, port, we say no. Um, as far as any particular ones we recommend, not, not really. Um, a variety of foods. Um, if you feel that you need a probiotic, there are some, there are several different ones on the market that you can try. This is my best answer for that one. Great, thank you. Um, do you know if vitamin D3 has uh, new benefits related to cancer? So we recommend, um, obviously I focus more on the transplant patient population, which we have studied vitamin D extensively at Cincinnati Children's. Um, and we find that our outcomes are better in our patients who have higher levels of vitamin D. Um, so we do um, some aggressive supplementation during the transplant process. Um, we recommend um, maintaining a good level. I know that the basic recommendation is above 20, like somewhere between 20 and 30, but we prefer our patients to be more in like the 40 to 60 range of vitamin D, which you are typically going to need some type of um, supplementation to get to that level. Um, as far as any specific um, direct relationship to cancer, no, is overall vitamin D um, good for overall health? I know that there are claims out there that higher vitamin D levels are better at preventing cancer. I don't know that we can officially say that. Okay, thank you. Lindsay, this one's for you um, from Donna. How soon could a metabolic fingerprint be used as a standard of care for people with FA when they get an assessment when first diagnosed after BMT? And then her follow-up to that is, are there current commonly used biochemical measurements that could provide individualized met metabolic information today that patients could request doctors measure? Um, so yeah, so that's a good question. So un unfortunately, um, the having an instrument like the one that Jack was pictured next to is uh, the limiting factor for a lot of institutions. There there aren't that many that that have um, a an instrument that will allow you to get the the metabolic signature. So that's the first limiting factor. Um, and so I will say that the, the idea in some other um, diseases and even in some cancer types is that a sort of um, enough, uh, let's say urine, enough urine specimens from, we'll say, individuals with and without breast cancer have been collected. And so um, because of that, you are able to very specifically, in some cases, you can collect an individual's urine and it is used as a, like a biomarker panel of sorts where you collect an individual's urine that you may suspect has that type of breast cancer or that you're just screening, maybe the person is, is of that advanced age. And so the idea is you run that and then you'll put that metabolic signature data into what we call a model and it either fits uh, with the group of people who do not have that cancer or it fits with the group of people who do. And we can say, okay, this is a red flag. And now we've, we've identified that person as, as needing more, you know, something further treatment or further tests. Um, but it is a good non-invasive way. I will say that currently it is difficult. Um, right now I'm just collecting samples at Cincinnati Children's or I'll go and collect, say, urines at Camp Sunshine. But because the, the population is small, it is difficult to get enough samples to build that model that, um, that would be needed. So short answer, yes, it is ultimately is, it is doable. This type of metabolic signature and fingerprinting is used in other populations and other diseases um, as sort of a biomarker screening of sorts. Um, we currently do not have the number of samples in any given sample type, either urine, blood, 
I, saliva, any of those in the FA population to make those determinations. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so now we're gonna move up back to a couple of the food questions. Um, so the first one is, are there certain foods that contain aldehydes that FA patients should avoid? So aldehydes um, are like a fermentable food for people who aren't familiar with those. I don't recommend avoiding any particular food or food group that's um, not my practice is to recommend avoiding things. Um, if it's something that you're strongly worried about, then limiting those types of foods in your diet. But I would never say don't eat these foods because they contain an aldehyde. Great, thank you so much. Um, we have another question about, it says, uh, my FA child, age 12, loves, loves processed meats, pepperoni, sausage, salami, bacon, which have components linked to colon cancer. Do you have thoughts on reasonable amounts per week? Um, yeah, so I saw this question in the Q&A. Um, I guess it depends right now how many times per week they're eating it or if this is like their only source of the protein during the week. So right now, if we're having bacon for breakfast, we're having a salami sandwich for lunch and we're doing pepperoni pizza for dinner, my recommendation right now is just to cut that back to one time a day and ultimately with a goal of trying to work that down into something three times a week. But it really depends on where we're starting out. So if it's several times a day, our initial goal would be to get it to those types of foods one time a day and then working them down to three times a week. Great. Um, and we have a question about uh, non-dairy milk, so almond milk compared to cow's milk, which um, is there specific rec recommendations around that? So this is, a, this is a great question that we didn't really um, address. So there are different types, there's lots and lots of different types of milks that are now on the market. Um, so there's animal-based milk, so there's cow's milk and goat's milk, and then um, we have more of these plant-based, nut-based milks as well. Um, these nut-based milks, the main, there's two problems with the nut-based milks. A, there's no protein in them. They have maybe one to two grams per serving, whereas a um, animal-based milk, like cow's milk, has eight grams per serving of protein. The other um, potential downside, depending on the type of nut milk that you're purchasing, a lot of them contain a lot of sugars to sweeten them and to flavor them. If you are doing an alternative to cow's milk because you're lactose intolerant, there it's okay, but you have to realize that you are not getting those same protein sources and you may be adding additional sugars to your diet. There are products um, on the market. There's one called Lactaid um, that has removed um, the lactose sugar from, which makes it easier to break down if you're lactose intolerant. So it really depends why we want to do an alternative milk source. Um, if we're more of a vegetarian, then I would recommend soy milk, which still contains good sources of um, protein in them. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, so this one might be more, well, this one's for both of you, perhaps. Um, so Mary Ann Lana asks, can metabolizing issues contribute to poor appetite? Um, I guess I'll I just say, and it, this this may actually be uh, area, Cindy's area more than mine. Um, and I'm I'm speculating. I mean, I I'm not sure that's known. I honestly, I mean, I don't know how much, um, and and maybe it is, and and Cindy will, Cindy will correct me. But and I would imagine at least how I envision how I think the um, the FA population or, or a, a proportion of the FA population may be um, recognizing. And I've talked to a number of the adults and even the, the adolescents about things like poor appetite. So I know that it's that's definitely a problem. Um, I know that in terms of, let's say with um, 
things like intermittent fasting and and even uh, the sort of the diet craze of uh, the keto diet, things like that, where you go into advanced states of um, of fasting, which I think I believe is happening, um, or, or a person with Fanconi's body believes is happening. Um, even if they're technically only fasting from the time they eat dinner until the next morning before they get breakfast. So I, I'm talking about, for the FA population, a very short period of fasting even. Um, I think that um, the body does naturally um, sometimes tend to not have, but not be basically you aren't as hungry. I mean, I, I, I mean, um, and, and this even comes from, um, we have, there are a couple studies. So I could see that being the case. I mean, and I also think it's an improper sensing possibly of the body where it, it believes that it has what it needs. Um, and then that's part of it, right? Is like, if you're, if your digestive system is or isn't digesting properly and you're, body is still trying to use, somehow use the nutrients that it has, um, then it's, you know, it may feel like it's still full or it's still trying to process those things. So um, from, I guess, a molecular standpoint, I guess I look at it more so um, as the body thinks it has what it needs, but it's likely using nutrients like skeletal muscle or fats that we really don't want it to use. Um, and so that, that's my perspective from a molecular standpoint. I think I would agree with Lindsay. I don't think we know the answer, but very potentially it could, it's a very, very possible that that's what's going on. Perfect, thank you. So I think we're about out of time for Q&A. Thank you guys so much for participating in that. That information is super helpful to families. I know they appreciate it so much. So thank you so much for being here.